So this afternoon's roundtable discussion uh, is entitled LGBTQ plus choirs, care and activism since the COVID pandemic. Uh, my name's Thomas Hilda. I think when I introduced the whole event earlier today, I even forgot to mention my name. <laughs> so now you finally know. Um, I'm based uh, in Trondheim, Norway. I'm associate professor in ethnomusicology at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. And I kind of um, wear several hats. I have uh, different identities in different spaces. And uh, one of those things is obviously a professor, associate professor in ethnomusicology. Um, so, um, and one of my main research uh, projects at the moment is on LGBTQ plus choirs. Um, I'm focusing on three cities uh, in a European context, Warsaw, Rome, and London. And um, I also am a musician myself. I'm a violinist and also a choral singer. So I've been performing in LGBTQ plus musical spaces for the last 10 years, in fact. Uh, I also helped uh, build up our local queer choir in Trondheim called Kordhem uh, over the last four and a half years. So I have these different identities as researcher, activist, and musician. And I know that many of um, the speakers today share those complicated identities uh, where we're not quite sure who we are in different spaces. Um, and I'm really interested in exploring those kinds of issues in the conversation today. Um, I uh, would just like to say a few things about LGBTQ plus um, choirs. We could trace the history of choirs, of these choirs, back to 1978, the Anacrusis choir that was founded in Philadelphia uh, with a kind of feminist mission. Um, choirs, LGBTQ plus choirs, sprung up in a European context um, from 1982 onwards, uh, and 1983 was the founding of the Pink Singers, uh, which Sien Chu is also a member of, uh, which was the very first mixed uh, LGBTQ plus choir in a European context. Pink Singers is from London. And since then, this scene has expanded uh, rapidly uh, throughout many cities uh, and other places around the world, uh, especially in the last 10, 15 years. Um, and we, in these spaces, we um, have a very diverse repertoire um, we have different performance styles, we introduce choreography, often we have different costumes. Uh, and although we often think uh, of choirs as being kind of conservative spaces for maintaining traditions, uh, we actually prove that choirs are a very flexible, um, uh, kind of malleable space um, where we can actually uh, think about ideas of inclusion and diversity uh, in new ways, especially in a kind of musical setting. And part of the thing that I really want to, us to explore today is the issue of care. Uh, so I mentioned some issues about care earlier in the introduction. Uh, I just wanted to go back to one quote again by Maria Puig de la Bella Casa in her book, Matters of Care, published in 2017, where she writes, quote, an ethics of care cannot be about a realm of normative obligations, but rather about thick, impure involvement in a world where the question of how to care needs to be posed. So I'd really like for us to have in this conversation a real kind of reflection on those practices that we bring through our own long-term engagement and experience with working with these spaces. So I don't want to actually introduce all of you um, with uh, all your amazing achievements because I would like you to do that all yourselves. So I just mention you all by name for a start. <laughs> Sien Chu, London. <laughs> Misha Czerniak from Warsaw, uh, Mary Ellen Kitchens from Munich, um, and Holly Patch from Dortmund. We have online Ricardo Strafaghetti. Um, if we could show actually uh, the gallery where we have Ricardo up there, and also Snorris Letton, who is the conductor of uh, our choir in Trondheim. So, I would just invite you to all introduce yourselves with a few things about what you do. I have the mic, so I guess I'll get it started. Yeah, I'm Holly Patch. I use the pronoun she, her. Um, I 
like Thomas said, am a research associate at the Technical University of Dortmund in sociology of gender relations. Um, I am working on my PhD at the University of Bielefeld, also in sociology, but I have a different background. I come out of uh, interdisciplinary gender studies programs, both in my BA and in my MA. I also studied vocal performance in undergrad, um, and so I think that was already the beginnings, doing you know two different kinds of study programs and bringing them together already at the undergraduate level has brought me to where I am now with this project um, on trans vocality. Um, I just realized that I have not ever sung in an LGBTQ choir or a queer choir space, although I did sing in several choirs um, throughout my training. And I think most importantly, I sang with the Oakdale Community Choir. It's um, run by Mary Cohen in Iowa City, Coralville, um, a choir with outside members and inside members of incarcerated people at the Oakdale Community Correctional Facility. I think I've got the name wrong. Um, but that was my first experience uh, thinking about choral singing or collective music making and social justice, and bringing them in combination. Um, yeah, so that's a bit about the background that brought me to this project on trans vocality, uh, for which I did ethnographic fieldwork with the Trans Chorus of Los Angeles. I did in-depth interviews with members of the chorus, different gender identification, different gender presentation, different voice parts, changing voice parts, um, and I did participant observation with them as well. And I think we will be discussing some of those <laughs> insights today in this discussion. Yeah, I think I'll hand it off now. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Misha Chernyak. Yes, pronounce he, him. I am originally Russian, which has become an even more awkward thing to say out loud this year than in previous years. But I've been living for 11 years in Poland, and um, I'm trained as a choral conductor, both in Russia and in Poland, and I'm not a scholar. <laughs> I'm, I don't know if it's an awkward thing to say in this setting or not, but uh, I, I'm, I'm coming into this uh, field from, um, from an activist and from a participatory perspective. Um, I've been an activist for many years in different fields, but also in LGBT plus activism and uh, and also at the intersection of LGBT plus issues and religion, which is a difficult topic for Eastern Europe as particularly. And um, so I, eight years ago, I founded the Polish, the, the first Polish, back then it was the, the, the only and uh, LGBTQ plus choir, uh, plus allies and friends, obviously, and uh, as a first and foremost as a form of activism for members of the community who felt that they lack that um, th that they lack diversity of options of how to be an activist in the field and so um, that attracted quite a lot of attention initially right now we are roughly 55 members and there is one more choir also in Krakow in the south of Poland which was founded actually independently but a couple of months after us um, and also one other hat here, I probably can say that I'm a board member of Legato Association of LGBT plus choirs in Europe. And yeah, that's probably it for me. Thanks, Misha. I don't know how to follow that up. Um, my name is Sien. Uh, nice to meet you all. I think I've spoken to some of you already. Um, I'm originally from Singapore, um, but I've lived in the UK now for just over 30 years. Um, like most people uh, in this group, uh, we've sung in choirs for ever since we were children. Um, and I uh, first joined a, a, a gay choir, an LGBT choir, in London in 2002. So that's my start of my LGBT uh, Q choir journey. I have to say it was the most amazing experience. Um, I joined the Pink Singers and it was the first time that I met a lot of people who were like me. And talking about safer spaces, this is one of this, this was my go-to uh, safer space. Um, because of that, I think I, I discovered the, um, the, the power that, that LGBTQ choirs have. And I was very um, keen to make sure that that this was shared with other LGBTQ choir, choirs. So in 2015, I set up an organization, in fact, no, before that, in 2013, I set up an organization called Proud Voices UK and Ireland, which brings together all the LGBTQ choirs um, across the UK and Ireland. We number about 60 choirs at the minute. Um, 
and then a couple of years after that, um, because I'm from Singapore, I returned to Singapore to meet up with the gay choir there. And um, from there, we set, we developed links with uh, other choirs in Asia, and then Proud Voices Asia was born in uh, 2014. Um, we are now about 30 choirs, mainly in China and Japan, but also in Southeast Asia, um, South Asia, and uh, one choir in West Asia as well. Uh, so my experience of choirs is that they are incredible, and I would like to talk a lot more about them. Pandemic has unfortunately put a, like quite heavy brakes on what was something that was um, developing momentum, but we are picking up now again. What a networker you are. <laughs> yes. Um, my name is Mary Ellen Kitchens, she, her. Um, thank you, Thomas, for putting together this group, um, working together with, with us and those online also. I think it's a wonderful opportunity, and I've uh, learned in the sessions that have taken place today already many things that will be useful in my choir work and my musical work. Um, I uh, trained as a musicologist um, a long time back in the United States and then in Paris and in Munich. And that, wh that is where I've lived for even longer than you live, have lived in the UK. Um, I work, um, traditionally I've worked with choirs and orchestras, um, sort of uh, well-versed amateur groups um, for a long period of time already, but um, in the middle of the 2000 not years, around 2005, I founded the Rainbow Choir Munich, Regenbogenchor München, which is one of the seven LGBTQI ensembles in Munich, um, and uh, we've been uh, existing singing since then. And about 10 years later, we founded the Rainbow Sound Orchestra in Munich. Um, that was sort of a prelude to the Various Voices Festival in 2018. So those are the groups that I work with, and I think the question of uh, care, of community, of working together in these groups is an essential one, um, and it has become more essential since uh, the pandemic arrived. Thank you very much. Um, Ricardo, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. Good evening. Uh, I would like to thank, first of all, Thomas very much for the opportunity to, uh, to be here, uh, even though I'm not there personally. I was planned to be there, but I had an unexpected event, so I couldn't be there in person. My name is Riccardo Strapaghetti, he, him. I'm from Italy, I'm based in Perugia, central Italy, and I'm part of the local LGBT choir in Perugia, which is called Onfalos Voices, that I contributed to found it in, in 2015. I had an experience as a singer in uh, uh, amateur groups, uh, uh, for several years, when in 2015 I, we tried with some friends to uh, found a LGBT choir. It, it is well, uh, this, kind of, this choir was one of the first choir in a small, medium sized city in Italy. Uh, and um, after um, a few years, we, uh, we also tried to, to found um, uh, an association, Italian as a national association, which is called Chromatica. And I'm a part of the board of um, Chromatica Association, which is an umbrella organization that um, gather together uh, 15 choirs, LGBT choirs all over Italy, uh, that uh, cooperate and work together to support our um, choral activism in Italy and to create uh, the festival, the Italian LGBT Choir Festival, which is called Chromatica. And first edition was in 2015. And now after the uh, two years of pandemic, <laughs> we try to, um, to, make, to make another uh, edition of the festival, which, which will be in uh, Roma, in Rome, capital city. Uh, Italy uh, next June. Um, so we try to, <laughs> to do a good festival after two years, we couldn't do it in Italy. 
thank you for the opportunity to be here and I would like to greet you warmly, each of you. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, Snorra, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, okay. So uh, uh, yeah, I'm Snorra and uh, uh, my pronouns are they, them. Uh, and uh, in Norwegian, I use the pronoun hen. Uh, and I conduct the uh, choir cool hen in Trondheim. And uh, as you can imagine, there is a pun going on in the name uh, with the hen pronoun. Uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, uh, this is the choir that uh, Thomas was um, board lead leader of. Um, and um, yeah, I've also, uh, also Thomas was my uh, supervisor uh, during my master thesis I finished uh, last year. Um, and it was about uh, student choirs in a gender and queer perspective. Uh, so I went uh, to uh, Tromsø, that's another town in Norway, uh, to uh, do research of uh, the student choirs there. Um, and uh, yeah, it was uh, really interesting. And um, uh, yeah, I was uh, looking at the different choirs and how they kind of perform genders. And of course, uh, uh, Judith Butler was very relevant there. Um, uh, yeah. And uh, unfortunately, I couldn't be in Vienna today because I had a concert yesterday with, uh, with Kuhan. Um, and uh, just to mention the occasion, uh, yesterday was actually uh, the 50 years anniversary of uh, the Norwegian law that uh, criminalized homosexuality uh, was removed back in 1972. Uh, so, yeah. I think that would be what I had to say about me, myself. Thank you very much, Snorri. And it was very sad for me to not be at the concert last night. That was the first time I haven't been with my choir at a concert. It's really wonderful to be able to have this discussion with all of you because I've got to know you in different ways at different times over the last six, seven, eight years. Um, and um, I'm sure we're gonna have a really um, lovely conversation today. I'd like to start with us reflecting about this idea of care and the histories of care that we bring to these choral spaces. So we often talk about LGBTQ plus choirs being safe spaces and this is very much, you know, moving on from, um, drawing on from your earlier presentation, Emilio. And um, so we think about these choirs as a kind of form of musical asylum beyond a transphobic, biphobic, and homophobic society, and a way of building new forms of kinship in order for the creation of new networks of care, queer care, we might call it. And there are many examples, for example, uh, um, of choirs emerging from HIV AIDS activism, such as the London Gay Men's Chorus, but we could also um, know some members um, but we also know many members of the LGBTQ plus community who do not necessarily feel safe in queer spaces. Um, so our choirs have been often the messy spaces where the hierarchies between different members of LGBTQ plus communities are negotiated. They're one of the few spaces where actually um, uh, spaces for mixed genders um, within the LGBTQ plus community. And new choirs um, often uh, are forged in order to meet the needs of certain marginalized community uh, members. For example, we've seen the emergence of trans choirs in the last decade. So recently, with more general uh, rising concerns of mental health, studies have shown the positive impact of communal singing on uh, health in general. So from a historical perspective, I'd like to pose this question to you all. How have our choirs offered forms of care to the specific but also diverse experiences of our local LGBTQ plus communities? I wondered who would like to take the mic first. That includes both Ricardo and Snorri as well. 
Mary Ellen? Um, yeah, I, I can start with one topic. I think this is many faceted. I think they're all different aspects of, of uh, care, of well-being, of um, the, the largest word is, is good community feeling in a choir. Uh, one thing that I think about very much myself, and it starts at the very beginning of the whole process, is which pieces we sing, which texts we sing, and whether or not we um, adjust texts of pieces that we choose that might not be especially appropriate for our choirs to our um, special means. And uh, this is something that really it's one of the very first things I consider when I'm choosing music. I love to choose wonderful music that I think will sound wonderful with my choir. I have the sound of my group in my ear, although it's changed a little bit with Corona now. Um, but um, I do have this vision of how a piece will sing or be sung and and sound, um, but if the text, the, the piece can be wonderful and especially fitting for my group, but if the text is not appropriate or is not inclusive or has anything that I think uh, might not go down to well with the choir, then it, then it would tend to exclude it or start thinking about how to retext. And that process is something that of course should be and can be communal, it's something you can use in a choir and you can, you can give the choir homework, or they can give you homework to work on a text that would reflect uh, where the group is at a given moment, maybe something that, that the group is working on or something that is happening in the world. It's something that, um, it, given our current world situation, is more important than ever. And um, there's nothing like a choir singing out something that it believes in. There's nothing like that. I think that's where I would start. Thank you very much. Um, I, I totally agree with all of that. Um, I would say that I, I would like to approach that from a slightly different perspective. I think that um, you know, when it comes to choirs, one thing I always ask is, why why is that choir there? What are they What are they doing? What is their What are the, their objective? And very often, when it comes to LGBT choirs in particular, it's about a combination of music leading to the development of a community space then leading on to a, a shared communal sense of identity, which then comes to a communal expression of pride in the public realm. And this is kind of the, the pathway that most of, these, most of our choirs take. And so the question then becomes, how can we as choirs facilitate all of this happening? By choosing the right kind of music, by creating the social spaces where this kind of interaction and conversations can take place, by communal activities, both performance and social that enable that linkages to happen and then from there and from there then taking it onto the road taking it into performance spaces taking it to pride marches taking it to other places where th that 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 community can be then visually and audibly expressed that's um, that's my approach to um, lgbt choirs Ricardo or Snorder, would you like to go next? Yeah, C can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, very good. Uh, see, my, my approach uh, about LGBT choir as a, um, as a musician and a, um, a singer in a, in a, an amateurial groups uh, before LGBT choirs is a, uh, of course, focusing on artistic uh, and artistic uh, meaning of the uh, the performance, the performance of the choir, but also um, focusing on the social practice uh, about this um, gathering together uh, of the singers, because singing together in a safe place like a LGBT contest um, can create bonds between singers and between the community. And also uh, it's very important to, um, for us, uh, for our choir, uh, it's very important to um, send a message to the audience on a public ground, for instance, in the city, and to connect to the others uh, cultural institutions, like uh, for instance, we had experience to, uh, to share music with the uh, university choirs, or maybe school, high school choirs. And we had this kind of um, 
experiences that um, um, create um, a very important um, uh, situation for our, for our choir. And for instance, for the for the members of the choir that uh, uh, show themselves in in, a, in an audience like uh, LGBT choirs um, empower people like uh, uh, in a, in front of the of the public uh, audience uh, in the in the city, for instance. And uh, of course, for us, it's very important. Uh, as uh, most of you. Uh, told before the the, the, the repertoire, uh, we tried to uh, focus in on the repertoire as well. Uh, for instance, um, creating new composition with the help of the composers. That, uh, for instance, la last last year, uh, no, two years ago, we tried to uh, um, turn in music. Um, uh, lyrics of the important philosopher in Perugia, which is called Aldo Capitini, which is a non-violent philosopher. So for these days can be very meaningful. And we try to communicate this, uh, this message uh, to, um, how can I say, to not only by the, the feeling um, of the music, but also with the with the meaning of the lyrics, the meaning of the message we try to uh, to communicate to the audience. Thank you, Misha. Would you like to? Okay. <laughs> um, maybe I'd I'd like to make make some kind of a step back and just to to without how to say praising ourselves too much, but say that the very existence of those choirs is a form of care. Um, and we cannot underestimate, uh, I mean, this is enormous. I'm, uh, for people, especially in hostile environments, uh, the fact that they have a space where they can just be themselves and let down their guard and, you know, just, just stop proving anything to themselves, to the world, especially to their f hostile families, because like Poland is a country of very serious religious upbringing, and I'm not trying to um, uh, say like I said, anything bad about religion per se, because I also work in this field, but also quite a few people in our community in Poland and in, a, in our choir have difficult relations with their families and their lack acceptance, and this is their chosen family. This is the place where they grow into be being a member of a circle. It's their, their family of choice, and so the very existence of those uh, things is a form of, of caring for people's mental health, their, their, their well-being, their just, just harmonious <laughs> being themselves, right? Uh, mm, and so that's first thing I wanted to say. The second one is, of course, that um, people grow to be kind of friends. It's it's not that the, this is how they naturally become friends with someone with growing up or attending school. So maybe these people are not whom they would have chosen to be um, in their natural uh, circle of friends, but they grow into really into having some kind of closer friendship there. The co they experiences uh, sometimes these experiences are harsh because sometimes what we've had to endure in the last two four years actually. Our choir started in 2014, and then in 2015, Poland turn, um, joined the countries with the right turn, and the populist regime um, taking power, grabbing power. So um, we were we were going through all of this, uh, you know, scapegoating of the queer community in Poland together. We were um, observing the collapse of, you know, the the country s sliding s towards, you know. Um, um, Practices of exclusion, like LGBT-free zones and, and the likes. So, um, in the in the situation when uh, the world shouts at you that you are not normal, that you have to hide your colors, or whatever, um, this was the place where people could sometimes share their anger, sometimes go to protesting together, and that's quite a lot. What we've been doing quite a lot over these years, um, even if we are not singing those protests that we we were at some, but um, we just we we went there. 
and we went there, and we had plenty of occasions to go out out in the streets for the queer community, but also for the migrants in a couple of year, couple of years ago, and also for the uh, female uh, issues that were, as you know, in Poland were a great problem in the last couple of years, pre-pandemic and early pandemic days with the reproductive rights. So uh, we've had plenty of t uh, occasions to to support each other, to how to say to. <laughs> to tend to each other's wounds in terms of how we survive through all of this, but also to celebrate some even small gains and small successes. And again, this is this space turns out to be a small glimpse of normality. And I'm using the word normality in, in a positive way here, not as normative, but like something as, as how things can be. And, and it's a glimpse of hopefully the future. And, and, and I think that's, that has been the experience that uh, that is crucial for people, and of course, not everyone gains this experience in, in a choral setting. But I think such such spaces uh, should be in every aspect of <laughs> human existence. I would say we need such spaces in the hostile countries like Poland or Russia. And one more thing, I would say, that just if for us it was important to care for each other in mentally disturbing situations like the pressure from the government, my thoughts are now about the for example, Ukrainian choirs that we have now who are tending to each other's needs and wounds in literally in times of war. So I think uh, these groups have, have enormous importance. Um, yeah, what I've learned from and about the TCLA resonates with everything that's been mentioned so far. Uh, to talk about historical origins of the chorus, um, it, the chorus was formed in 2015 it was a passion project of the artistic director at the time following the death of Leela Alcorn in Ohio. Um, so that speaks to inherently out of a sense of establishing care for one's community uh, through creating a choir. But I, I don't think that care is maybe the word that I would apply to this chorus. It's definitely not the discursive word being used in their space. Um, but this course was established as uh, outward oriented, uh, rather focused in activism um, through their visibility, through their presence. Uh, and the word I've, I've used to talk about the chorus is flourishing because they've shown not only a freedom from in the sense of uh, a safe space away from transphobia, for example, um, but it's also about a freedom too. <laughs> so there's not a lot of discursive establishing of what are the terms uh, of how we interact with each other in this space, but the caring practices are already there. I think they're uh, well practiced with these people um, in, in various different spaces. And I think there was a relief coming to this chorus that it didn't have to be another safe space, another space to talk about trans existence and the hardships. They got to go there and sing, and <laughs> that, that was the point. It, was, it didn't matter what the politics of the space were or if they really agreed with each other. And I think there's a lot of freedom in that. Um, so I just want to make that clarification about the emergence of this trans chorus was not about needing their own space to be safe, but really to uh, fill the choral form with trans voices, be heard and be seen uh, in their flourishing. But caring practices, of course, exist in this space, from how they treat each other to um, uh, not only singing and, and you know having this physical touch being a kind of healing, a kind of care for one another, but also breaking for dinner together uh, within this choral space. So lots of ways that I think care can be imagined within this group. Um, yeah. But, I guess that is calling for but, but the word I would stress would be, would be flourishing is what happens in this chorus. Thank you. Um, Snorri, would you like to? Yeah. Um, so, um, um, yeah, uh, I feel uh, that, um, uh, so um, I think it has been very important for queer people to, to be joining a choir and not only um, queer choir, like specifically queer choir, but also uh, every other choir. Um, like in my research, I, I got the impression that uh, there were a significant amount of queer people uh, in the choirs, uh, although they were not uh, specifically queer choirs. And 
Yeah, and it's like, uh, why does, um, why is it important, and why? Um, and um, I would suggest, like, the main uh, reason is just by get gathering together and like do something together, and I think that's probably the most important thing. Uh, you create this safe space, um, and um, uh, yeah. So um, uh, yeah, that was uh, also. Um, I would like to uh, raise the question again from the last presentation. This um, safe spaces um, um, are so. Are the safe spaces safe? Um, um, what makes them safe and um, yeah, just actually be critical about um, yeah, if they are safe um, because um, yeah, just by, by calling it safe space doesn't make it safe for everybody and we have to uh, know about what makes them safe and uh, like not only just say that um, you shouldn't call people like this and like that, and uh, but really think about uh, how why you should do that, and so everybody agree. Um, because I've been thinking about this lately. That um, uh, I mean, you. It's also kind of a restriction. Um, and I'm not trying to sound very old fashioned, like, oh, you can't say anything these days. Uh, but um, yeah, just be a little critical in like both ways, uh, I think would be wise. Yeah. I just wanted to add to what Holly said earlier because I totally agree with that. You know, I think that um, not all choirs need to be about creating a safe space. It is about celebration. It's about being out there and being heard. Um, but I think many choirs, um, certainly in the West, come out of a, a very activist um, history. Certainly, the Pink Singers that I'm in has a very activist history. It came out of that, you know, the mid 80s in the UK when there were lots of protests going on against Section 28 about the closure of the mine. So there was a real sort of desire to be out there and be heard, and that has continued to today. Um, I, I spoke about the Japanese choirs really um, uh, briefly in one of the earlier presentations, but many of the Japanese choirs. Um, within the constraints of, of the Japanese culture um, can only express themselves in very particular ways and protest is not necessarily one of those ways. And so these, these choirs form because they really love a particular style of music. Often it's the king singers for some reason. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and so you have lots of, of choirs around Japan, LGBT choirs around Japan who gather because they want to sing a particular style of music. And there's lots of joy and enjoyment in that. Um, and the fact that you're getting together with people who have similar minds in a, in a shared space is already a wonderful act of care. Um, but their focus is not about pushing the, the, the agenda or whatever uh, forward. Great, thank you very much. I like this whole idea of drawing from Sarah with this idea that we don't just create documents, but we actively put those documents into practice. They become part of our embodied knowledge and routines within these spaces. Uh, and we can think about, um, we can think about um, safety as tending to each other's wounds. I thought that was a really wonderful way of uh, putting it, uh, Misha. Uh, but also this idea of flourishing as well. Thank you, Holly. So my next question actually is about specifically COVID. So the COVID pandemic has obviously hovered a offered a huge challenge to well, the whole world uh, and also especially to our work. Mm -hmm. So rehearsals and concerts were initially banned and have since been subject to restrictions of different degrees depending on the regional context, very much owing to concerns that communal singing enables greater transmission of COVID. Queer people are arguably quite skilled in dealing with crises, yet studies have shown that LGBTQ plus youth especially have suffered greatly through social isolation. 
And our choral work and our activism rely so heavily on being physically present with one another and, of course, being visible in public. So I've witnessed through my research how choirs have dealt with these challenges in multiple and creative ways. I'm sure many, have seen, many of us have seen virtual choir videos shared on social media, uh, and that's been very prominent also within our communities. So how have our musical practices, organizing strategies, and politics been shaped by the challenges of the COVID pandemic as we have searched for new ways to care for our communities? Okay, I'm going to kick this one off. This is uh, quite a big topic, I have to say. Um, <laughs> um, so, uh, the, as I said, most choirs uh, sing music because they enjoy it and because they want to be better and they want to perform. But the music and the performance is not the end in itself. It is a means towards creating a community and towards expressions of pride uh, for some choirs. So... When, a choir, when the pandemic hit, suddenly the very fundamental root of what we, we did suddenly was ripped out from under us. And I think our choirs all went into this real crisis of confidence. How could we maintain our communities when the thing that we gathered to do could no longer be done? Um, and this was a huge um, question that, that no one really had answers to. I think the, uh, in Proud Voices UK and Ireland, we organized several uh, seminars, and the f one of the first ones was really about trying to challenge the rules that were put in front of us. Like, you know, one of the reasons that, that choir, um, first of all, choirs, choir, choral activity was portrayed as the most dangerous activity that you could possibly do. You know, when, <laughs> when you said, oh, I'm in a choir, they go, why, God, that's dangerous. I mean, that has never happened before. <laughs> So, so this was um, this was really it was it was a real challenge to us, and so we are looking at, at at ways, and we're still looking at ways to, in our neoliberal society, provide evidence that we have value, because there were lots of other activities that could be done, which were arguably as dangerous, but were permitted because they provo provided economic value, and so unfortunately that was one of the things that we had to address. The other things that we organized seminars around were like how to keep people engaged. Um, and that was really difficult because many choirs um, are, are contingent upon rehearsals. They pick up funding at rehearsals. People pay money to attend a rehearsal. And then that money then goes on to pay a musical director. What happens when you don't gather for musical um, sessions? Where does that money come from? How do you collect that money? So there was a lot of um, fundamental infrastructure questions that needed to be answered as well. Um, the, the, uh, the idea of singing online, uh, you know, after two years of it, I'm, just like, I'm so over it. <laughs> it, is not, it is not satisfying at all. You don't get any sense of um, the harmonies. You don't get the one, of the... one of the wonderful things about being in a choir and singing live is that when you sing, you can hear other people and you can hear the chords forming. And if a chord slightly breaks, everyone else adjusts automatically to it to repair it. And it's that dynamic response, which you just cannot get on a Zoom call and you cannot get in a virtual choir. And I, I just miss that so much. I remember the very first time I got together with some friends and we were at the Barbican in London with lovely acoustic because there were lots of concrete walls and we were outside. And I cried because it was the first time in about a year and a half that I could hear that again. And I remembered what it felt like. Um, so in terms of trying to build the community again while we're waiting for that process to come back, um, I guess, certainly in the Pink Singers, we, we looked at what we were fundamentally about as a choir. And you know, we're very proud to be a, a mixed gender, mixed sexuality choir. And we're diverse in lots of many other ways as well, in terms of ethnicity, religious belief, um, ability and disability. And so we thought, well, here's our chance to really explore that with other people. Let's talk about it. You know, let, let's platform people and hear their stories. And so we created a series of um, Zoom calls, which were interactive, um, with members of the choir um, from different groups. Uh, we had talks about um, the AIDS crisis and people's experience of AIDS that was precipitated um, by a TV show called It's a Sin. And so we had a conversation called It's a Sin. 
um, we had a talk um, with a, a former member of the Pink Singers who is a member of the Vogue scene up in uh, Manchester. Um, these things are all on YouTube. Please go, please go look them up. They are really deeply fascinating, to me at least. Um, and we've also had talks around um, uh, for instance, religion, religious minorities. So uh, we invited speakers in to talk about um, uh, Islam and LGBT uh, as a way of sort of get, getting people talking about the, the kind of diversity that we really want to promote as a choir. And I think, I believe that these conversations did bring people together. Um, we're working on a, Misha and I are working on a project together as well, talking about queer lives um, in, in the countries that we're from. And we did this as a cross choral collaboration where we've run a series of seminars um, with a variety of speakers in which our choirs participate and we've had sessions on queer lives in uh, Russia, queer lives in uh, Poland and queer lives in the UK and it just highlights some of the issues, the similarities and also some of the different issues that uh, exist across um, our different communities as well. So I think um, as I was telling Mary Ellen earlier, the, the, the pandemic has been a real struggle, but it has also given us a, an opportunity to pause and reflect about the values of our community, um, and then to try to find ways in which we could really reinforce these values um, in ways that we couldn't before, because we were so on the, you know, the next performance is coming up, let's rehearse, next performance is coming up, let's rehearse, and we had no time to think about that. Uh, about all of the fundamentals while we were on that sort of um, hamster wheel almost. Yes, I would agree completely that it's a time for uh, reinvention, um, not of the wheel, <laughs> but of the choir, um, in the sense that um, we were forced to take pause. Um, I, would, I must say, um, about one week elf after things all closed down, I went right back online. Um, I tried to do as much as I could musically, but also socially. Uh, online, it was a huge effort. Um, it was rethinking every week. It was a lot of discussion with the board and with individual members of the group, um, trying to be inclusive. Also, in the online situation, not everyone has the same approach to working online. It's completely different. Each of us has a different uh, different feeling about that. And there were people who just said, I, I can't imagine working online. Well, how do you pick them up? Um, can you meet one-on-one -on -one because only that is allowed? Or um, could you meet in a certain part of the city with certain part of the group? Uh, we tried basically every model that we could think of. Um, one thing that I concentrated on a lot was giving at least in the in the first phase, because it sort of it made a lot of sense. Um, I worked on giving background to the pieces that we were working on that perhaps had even been created for us. So I pulled in the composers, many of them women composers, is a specialty of mine, um, and from afar also. So we would meet online and discuss the backgrounds, and maybe that person would play the piece for us. Um, we experimented with. Um, singing, you can't really sing together via Zoom, not, not too many people and nothing fast for sure, <laughs> but um, we uh, tried singing in phrases so that we could hear the different voices a little bit, at least for those who felt comfortable in doing so, not everyone did. Um, a held chord can be sung with an open mic, it doesn't sound too great, but you hear the other voices a little bit. So the loneliness um, that happened um, from not being able to go to choir on Monday or on Wednesday um, could could be met a little bit, at least in the beginning phase. I think with time that got old, I felt that it was hard to sort of maintain stamina during that time. And of course, we used every opportunity when there were uh, at least um, brief openings or openings for a few people to meet up, to meet in smaller groups, to work um, in a hybrid fashion, or um, just to work as a quartet. All of these different, we, we tried everything. <laughs> we really tried everything. Um, but what was a special joy was really meeting with the creators of our pieces online, or even creating, working on creating new ideas and new pieces during this phase, just thinking ahead, um, thinking about future projects. That was certainly a, a topic as well. Sure. Um, I did my field work with the TCLA before the pandemic, um, but I've kept up with what they've been producing since then. 
Um, one thing I wanted to mention was that the Gay and Lesbian Association of Courses had planned their um, festival to feature the trans courses, but that was, of course, canceled because of the pandemic. Um, and instead, they had, um, on Trans Day of Resilience in November 2019, they did a Roses concert of past, present, and future trans resilience uh, that featured the uh, outward-oriented trans-identified choruses of the gala choruses. Um, there is a clip of that. I don't know if that's the moment for it. Um, but that was, I think, a big moment in terms of uh, trans choral uh, activity <laughs> out there, yeah. So it happened in pandemic still. They were able to make that happen. Snorri, did you want to say something about our experiences in Trondheim? Yes. Um, so um, I am, uh, as I mentioned, I, I, I conduct Call Hen, uh, but I'm also conducting a female choir. Uh, also, I am uh, singing in a semi professional choir. So we had some um, different um, experiences during the uh, lockdown and uh, this corona times. Uh, I would like to share a little bit. Um, so, um, for example, in the uh, semi-professional choir, we were kind of striving to continue and people, uh, we, we we were like forcing all the kind of rules, uh, how we should perform, like we should stand two meters apart that way and then four meters apart that way. Um, and then Keep, and we just persisted on like rehearsing and um, at one time we weren't al allowed to perform but we were not allowed to rehearse um, and uh, yeah it was really hard and then we had to move location like we had to uh, sing in a in a huge uh, hallway or corridor and uh, yeah it was really hard and I think the Norwegian, like the cultural life have, has really been like bleeding uh, lately. And, um, and it's interesting to see that they have many, they had so many rules about uh, cultural life, but then they didn't have as many rules at, as, for example, uh, bar life, like going, uh, going out and drinking. Uh, and then it's, Kind of obvious there is a there is an economy a reason for this, and uh, I just want to mention the one of the really stupid rules where that uh, you could have two hundred people in the audience uh, if the chairs were um, stuck in the floor, uh, and just strange things like that. Um, so it has been really hard. Um, and uh, for the, the choral practices, it has been really hard. And uh, we tried it, as you mentioned, uh, we tried the video rehearsals. I mean, I hardly want to talk about it, it was terrible. Uh, so, uh, but at least we get to get, see each other's faces. And um, at, um, I, so I was singing in choirs in Tromsø, uh, the other town I mentioned. and. Uh, we had some kind of hangouts um, during we video. We were kind of having a small party. Uh, so, and in this uh, occasion, actually, um, the Corona crisis kind of brought us together because I was here in Trondheim, uh, and then suddenly I could hang out with people in another town, and uh, not to mention uh, here I can sit in my home and I can still participate in this uh, conversation. Uh, so in that sense, uh, things have changed and uh, maybe for the better. Um, so, um, uh, but in most cases uh, for the uh, female choir, we, um, 
I mean, there were so many rules that we can't follow everything. So we just uh, freeze kind of the activity. And I think the really problem with that was that um, people are getting used to not attending to rehearsals. Um, they're just so, and I think that's the most dangerous thing about uh, the whole thing is that, uh, yeah, they're getting used to not be there. Uh, they got no, so like, for example, a Tuesday is not uh, a rehearsed day anymore. It's like not the secret, sacred uh, thing that I do on a Tuesday. Uh, and I think that's uh, been really a, a problem. And for future, um, like how to maintain a choir, I think maybe the most important is the, yeah, the, the gathering and the community and just continue. It, it is a sacred time we have to like maintain. And of course, if people are sick and cannot attend, then that's fine. But um, we should try to uh, have the her rehearsal anyway. So we rehearse who, uh, even, even if there's only a couple of people, we can rehearse or we can drink coffee or we can just chat, uh, but just maintaining the uh, occasion, I think is really important. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Snorra. Uh, and that makes me think of um, also the whole logistical issues, um, uh, which are often the responsibility of organizers as well. And so I can just relate my own experiences within those two years of having to constantly <laughs> read the latest guidelines, information, work out how we're gonna work, make this work in the space that we have for free. Oh no, we can't do it here because there's not enough room. We have to find somewhere else. There were so many balls up in the air that just each week there was just all these question marks. I was just exhausted and I think I just experienced the kind of burnout and actually just had to like take it a bit easier because of the amount of labor involved in doing that. So all these things that aren't actually you know, um, visible um, 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 to, to wider audiences as well, the, the huge amounts of labor that goes into our efforts. Unpaid care, another example, which we do with a lot of love um, uh, and uh, with joy as well. Um, Ricardo, did you want to add something about your experiences in Perugia and more generally in Italy? Yes. Yeah, um, yeah, pandemic is a, such a topic during last two years. And yeah, during uh, last pandemic has been very challenging to all our, to all the group that are based on volunteering job, such are ours, our choirs. And that normally they were used to leave the spaces of the cities, such as the streets for, for instance, for prides or concert hall uh, for sharing music with an audience or even LGBT venues for uh, specific events uh, of the community. Um, so it was very challenging. Of course, uh, as uh, many choirs, we experimented singing via Zoom, but uh, I can't lie uh, to you, the experience uh, <laughs> was very frustrating. Um, I think that uh, the experience of all the Italian choirs uh, uh, is that uh, we found very important support during the pandemic uh, in uh, the chromatica network. In fact, we we think about this that we we thought about this uh, normally even before pandemic. Uh, of course, each chromatica choir, local choir, meets up in the of course, local groups to create events, to share music. But we were, we got used to work as a chromatica network online, uh, even without uh, actually meeting a couple of times during the year. But we tried to use this experience uh, uh, so we th to, to, to cooperate together online. And we, uh, we, we tried not to um, tr transform uh, our existing choir in a video virtual choir, uh, because this experience for some choirs uh, could be very <laughs> frustrating, as I 
uh, said before, but we try to get the, the, the chance to create a new choir, a choir that doesn't exist in, uh, in, real because, in reality because uh, uh, the members of this uh, virtual choir can't gather together for rehearsal because of the distance. So we, we try to create this, uh, which we call it chromatic choir, and we, we produced a video, uh, a virtual choir, uh, formed by more than 200 singers from all over Italy and even uh, other parts of the, the world because uh, lots of uh, singers abroad joined our choir and we, we create this uh, Bella Ciao virtual choir video which is very, and I, I remember that during the, um, the job uh, of cr creating this uh, this choir, sharing the, the score, the the tutorials, it was very um, exciting because we we connected with people, uh, with new singers, and we we get the feelings that we were creating something new. Um, we didn't just uh, um, uh, I can say uh, surrogate our existing choir uh, into into a virtual choir so that can be a frustrating experience but we try to uh, make something to create a, a new choir uh, simply a new choir so we produced this bella ciao virtual choir video and uh, we were very surprising that uh, we had all this uh, participation i remember singers from uh, London, Geneva, Bruxelles, uh, uh, even for Canada uh, or Singapore. It was very, very exciting. And I think that this that um, gets, uh, uh, I, I, was, it was very supportive and helped us to, to focus on the, the future projects. And yeah, I think this is the most uh, interesting experience we did during the the pandemic and of course also we we had the chance to focus on discussion via i mean to to focusing via zoom about some lgbt issues uh, involving choirs uh, and a group of us create a podcast in which we we were speaking about uh, different issues for instance uh, uh, like tra transgender voices people inside the uh, inside our choir, so we interviewed people that we would like to uh, speak up about some uh, some issue that normally um, during the the normal how can I say normal activity of the choir uh, maybe we didn't focus so much for in this activity. I mean to share from choir to another choir, share together all these issues so maybe these kind of issues were um, uh, inside each choir but we didn't get the chance before the the pandemic period to share these uh, topics uh, with other choirs so i think that these are two experiences that uh, i can remember as positive and uh, we we grow through this uh, through this experience during this pandemic Thank you, Ricardo. Um, would this be the time to play actually the video of the virtual chromatica choir? Um, uh, could I? Um Perhaps just add, uh, we, um, because it reminds me so much of a project that we also did and which caused um, even joy uh, during this so, such a difficult time. Um, we had a, a short term for it, it was called the EMU, the EMU project, <laughs> that, that crazy bird. Um, that stood for Edinburgh, Munich and Ukraine. And um, this was a project put together by Munich Kiev Queer. Munich is a partner city actually to Kiev. Um, but we sort of see that as a wider Ukraine um, connection, and Edinburgh. And uh, this was a, a project that was put together at the beginning of 2012. 
we met three times on online in the spring of 21 and then in the advent um, phase with the Christmas meeting also in that year. Um, it was Kathleen Crony with Loud and Proud. I see her online here uh, in Edinburgh. Hello, Kath Kathleen. And uh, Olga Rubtsova, who was in Odessa and working together with some members of her choir. Um, I think we will probably hear a word from her later on. Um, it was um, a great pleasure and one of the products of this project, which was, it was unusual. There were more than 100 people uh, participating from the three countries. And actually, um, it was a woman called Stephanie Hügler and Samantha Seymour who put the project together. So thanks to those two as well. Um, we did a little project, um, which was a virtual video, just one minute long. It's the piece Love is Love is Love is Love by Abby Bettinas. I think it might be nice to have a look at that. We have Olga Rubtsova also in the digital audience and you wrote something in the chat. Would you like to um, read it out to us or would you like us to read it? I can also read Olga's contribution to the discussion as well. So due to the hostilities in Ukraine, uh, some girls weren't able to go abroad, but still the majority remained, especially the guys who are not allowed to leave. At the same time, many people today are not even in their homes and not even in their cities. For Ukrainians, the big question is, when can we stop fighting? Who better than representatives of the LGBTQ plus community to know how hard it is to defend their rights? We survived all the waves of corona and hoped for this uh, spring. I hope that our choirs will be able to sing together again, but today it seems impossible. Now the main question for us is to support those who have lost a lot, but keep hope. More Now more than 20 people from several LGBTQ plus choirs in Ukraine are in need of banal things such as food and a place to live. Some organizations were able to organize shelters, uh, but the issue uh, of food and medi medicine remains relevant. I can't even imagine when the day will come for our songs. So thank you very much, Olga Rubtsova, um, who, if I'm not mistaken, is the musical director of Querti Queer in Odessa. We have been discussing for quite a while, um, and I did have kind of one other question which would open up a huge <laughs> amount of discussion as well, but I didn't, uh, I wanted to make sure that everyone also had a, a, a moment to ask questions. Misha, would you like to add something? Also not just I, s I didn't have the chance to say anything about the COVID. Sorry. No. No, no problem. Just a couple of things. I think we should be clear that this is, was a really experience of trauma for all of us. And, uh, um, and, and I think we should learn to use that vocabulary about this experience. Because it was two years for our choir. This is 25% of our existence have been taken hostage by, by the COVID pandemic. So it, I think it's an important that we recognize this and uh, if we're talking about care, that we know how to deal with this and we know how to support each other in all of this. And also, I mean, one of the positive things that we've taken out of the COVID experience is the flexibility, but also acknowledging that we are not superhumans. So for example, I know in, in the first year of pandemic, I decided that I will pull, off, pull together the voice uh, rehearsals. So my time to the choir quadrupled and um, the toll, personal and family was rather serious. And in the second year I said, no, I just, I said, I won't, I won't be able to do this. But also what and it, it taught us some other good things, like we got back to open air uh, singing, which in the past we, we told ourselves, no, this is not gonna have it happen. We don't like singing open air, but this was actually a blessing for a couple of months. So uh, flexibility and also being very attentive and um, to what's happening for everyone and even in the smaller parts of the choir, smaller groups was important. And I think uh, what helped us survive is that we uh, 
um, for some time, even when we abandoned singing, we stayed together just as a pe group of people who know each other and want to support each other. And um, yeah, so that, that that was good. And we didn't also, you know, push the choral agenda of the choir to for at, at any expense because we, a friendly choir of ours made a retreat f somewhere in September 2020, and it was a super spreading event for them. So um, I think the being very flexible and uh, it was it was a good thing. But also uh, one anecdote about the how much time it took. Two of our choir members managed to become mothers in, in over the time of pandemic. So like this was a really long time um, for for all of us. And I think that's um, uh, the the repercussions will be heard sometime after this because some people said. Um, for some people, rehearsing online was okay. For some people, it was so out of the question completely, and, and so on. So th there will be more things. But again, this year we have now a more tra traumatic event. So the, what you, uh, what was, uh, it was very important to, to hear Olga's words. Thank you, Olga. Thank you very much for all your contributions to the discussion. It's been wonderful talking with all of you. Um, and continuing our conversations that we began, some of you in the last year, but some of you uh, many years before. Uh, it's been a wonderful privilege to have this conversation. Thank you very much, Ricardo, in Peru. Thank you, thank you, thank you all. Thank you very much, Snorre. Thank you, it's been an honor to participate. Uh, thank you, Holly. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Misha. <laughs> thank you, Sian. <laughs> and thank you, Marianne. Thank you. <laughs> <Many> thanks. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you also to Connie for supervising us. Sorry.